this area here under a hand. So I didn't define that um, that hand too much, um, but I think that you can grasp that it's a hand. I also didn't define her face too much because we're going to spend some time really drilling into her face. Well, that sounds terrible. Really um, studying her face, really looking into it. Okay. And I'll just add a little bit of artistic license and have the snake's tail come down because I kind of like the idea of it coming off there. You can see the line behind it though, so I might just get rid of that. Okay, so that's a good little quick study of her. I'm going to add in a few little highlights, just because we can. And some of these I might push back a little bit. Poses. So much like with the graphite too, you can get different levels of highlight by it how hard you press down on the page. And also what you're using for your white too. Okay, I'm just going to take um, a blending stick and just take the edges off some of those whites where they're more stark. There's no highlights on our snake. Okay. All right, I think that that served us well to get an understanding of Eve. And now what we should do is look at her face. All right, so what I'm doing is looking at the reference, not at the page too much. And I'm looking at shapes. I'm trying not to let my brain tell me where it thinks things belong. 
and just really observe the shapes that are present in front of me. Same thing, nice and light, light and loose lines. We'll push these back. Just looking at shapes, looking at the reference. Looking at the shapes in reference to other shapes, how they fit. That noisy little bird that you can hear now is called a peewee. And there's of course the doves in the background. Constant. I don't think that they really care what season it is. They seem to have babies all the time. Looks like I've drawn spectacles for her, but that's what I'm looking at there is the um, eye socket, the cavity of the eye there. And I'm noting the small distance between the eye and the nose. Lips. So her upper lip is in shadow, her lower lip is pretty much all in light and there's a deep shadow beneath it. And there's not a lot of room for her chin before it's the bottom of her chin that we can see because we're looking up and under. And I'm looking at her ears when, when um, somebody's front on, the ears are usually level with the nose, but here they're actually lo level with the lower lip because of the angle that we've got. So I need to make sure that I capture that correctly. And this, um, almost like a braid, I suppose, this curls of her hair where they are in reference to her eyes and her nose. Her neck is almost in a straight line from this side of the face and this side of the, it curls in. You can see a bit more of the hair on this side. And we'll just trail that part off there. And I'm looking at the length of the neck here where that shadow is. Nice long leg. Oh, listen to that. Everybody's going to mow their lawns now that we're doing this. Between the birds and the lawnmowers. <laughs> I hope it's not too loud for you. I don't know if you can hear in the background, there's a bird that's going woo, woo. That one there. It's pretty exciting actually. That's called a coel. And it's a big uh, bird. It's a cuckoo. And it comes from Indonesia and Papua. It comes down once a year down to these coastal areas from just below the Queensland border all the way down to close to the Victorian border. Just to lay its eggs in other birds nests <laughs> so this time of the year and it, it, it's all day and all night that 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 sound is you'll see these big well the females are not pretty and black like the male 
Um, you see these big birds flying around. They, they often lay in wattle birds or in um, currawong nests. And currawongs is one thing. Currawongs are quite big, but wattle birds are nowhere near as big as um, coel birds are. So they're left to raise this ginormous baby that's, you know, three times the size of their own, what their own youngsters would be. I always feel really sorry for them. But by the same token, it's pretty ingenious that they come all the way down here just at this time of the year. And they eat fruit, so I have a mulberry tree that's covered in fruit at the moment, so that I always have coels. And that's a, just a little bit of bird knowledge for you. Today, I think it's really sweet towards the end of the, t the time that they're here. I'm not thinking they're so sweet anymore, but, um, you know, it's pretty exciting, pretty precious to be, to have access to so much nature around me. Okay, so that's the basic form of her down. I'll sit down again and we'll start to do exactly the same process as we did with the larger figure. Um, I'll sort of define her form a little bit, push her back, and we'll go from there. Okay, so I'm just really sort of looking at the form. How it works in space, what I might need to adjust. Isn't she beautiful? I just, I find it um, so humbling to really, really take time to view pieces of art and statuary and stuff like this. You know, knowing that these are centuries, years, centuries old and that it was done without modern technology. It was done through pure observation and um, development of skill you know nobody wakes up one day and they're suddenly able to do these sorts of things this comes from practice and i can't stress that enough you know everything is practice and the same you know as a sports person you wouldn't expect to get up one morning and be able to run marathons etc you need to train for it it's, training is practice I'm just looking at the brow at the moment, at the way that it sits in her skull, how closely the brow line comes to the edge of her face here. And then I'll look at the distance between the brow line and her upper lid. And the shape of her upper lid. And then it's not a, f a very defined uh, lid, the lower lid rather. There's a lot of similar tones here, but I can see that the shadow is forming on the um, underside of her lower lid. So I, I'm more looking to draw in that shadow than I am anything else. You see that that comes right down and that this shadow and there, much darker shadow on this side. And 
And so this eye, making sure it's on that same plane. And you can sort of see that there's a side to her face almost here where, where the light is catching. So um, whereas on this side, her brow line goes straight to the edge of her face because of the angle, because of the foreshortening. So just need to be aware of that. And I need to look at the bridge of her nose, like how wide is that? And this shadow in her eye socket is quite dark. And then, you know, I'm looking at the reference constantly, but I'm also looking at where I put the eye on this side, because I don't want it, her to have one eye that's really high and one eye that's too low. So they need to work in reference to each other as well, as shapes, as shapes in space. And she's actually looking a little bit this way. So that also changes the way that the eyeball sits in the socket and will then elongate the side away from the way she's looking. So you can see it's quite elongated on this side compared to here. So it's just viewing those shapes, you know, really taking the time to notice. that that works okay. Now who knows, so there's a little block of shadow just here above her nostril and you turn the little patch of white just between, or of light rather, sorry, just between the, the darkness of her eye socket and the mid-tone of her cheek. Now nostrils. And I'm looking here on the bridge of her nose, she's actually got two light spots either side, the darkness, the shadow, is it forms almost like a little crescent moon there, and keeping in mind that we've got all these angles in the face, so they're all they all need to face the same way to look right. A nostril there. Need to find that a bit more yet. And we've got a bow, Cuckoo's bow, and I can see her mouth's a little bit off centre there. Need to move that across a little bit. And I'm looking at the the shapes of that sort of M of her top lip. I'm just going to sort of shade those shapes in, I'm not making a defined line because we don't have lines on our lips unless we actually use lipstick and lip liner. You see that the top lip sort of comes over the bottom lip here. And that it extends to past the nose, but not greatly, on this side more so. It's a really light highlight here on her bottom lip. But Mostly the definition comes from the shadow underneath her lip. I'll define that a little bit more yet too. We've got quite a light bit there for her chin. And it's okay to draw in. Um, 
highlights where you want them to be that re reminds you to not only keep that area pristine as much as you can so that the gray doesn't tint the white that we put down but it also helps to give you um, an understanding of how much tone you need to have around them too because these highlights don't exist in a vacuum you know like in order for them to be seen there has to be darkness around them so it looks a bit funny she's got um, stuff drawn all over it that will help me define that especially because I am going to push this back this is just the first uh, layer of definition on top of our initial scribble and people often ask me why I say scribble because these are clearly a drawing in and I suppose I say scribble for the majority of things that I do like this because I don't I have I'm taking them serious to an extent but I'm really okay if it doesn't work out if it um, doesn't become you know a fully rendered final drawing um, I don't want to take myself too seriously I suppose and I don't want to um, turn the process into something that I've become frightened by because I have to perform you know like it's um, it's about connection for me it's about um, being present as I said before, I can't I can't say this enough because it's the utter truth. It's it's um, a form of meditation for me. So I don't have you know like any atelier academic skills in uh, drawing. I'm self-taught, other than what I did in high school and the few lessons that I've taken online with people like Ivy. Um, so yeah, I, I guess that that's probably why I call them schools more than anything else. And it's not self-deprecating or self-depreciating in any way. Um, it's an act of remaining humble for me. Uh, and, you know, trusting that process to help me determine whether something goes on to become a final drawing or if it just remains a wee scribble. And both are equally as valid, if you ask me. Time sp spent practicing is what it's all about. Um, I'm not a show pony. We're not show ponies. We, we're here to enjoy this practice. If other people really enjoy it, then that's excellent. They want to scribble along beside. Fantastic, I think. I think that's more important. Connection. Community. creating together. Creating's magic. Okay, so she's coming along nicely I think. I'm just going to grab that cotton wool but I'm going to use the side that I don't have too much graphite on. Oops, sorry. Uh, from the previous one. I just don't want to um, push too much colour onto the page. I just want to soften her give her a bit of an overall tone. And I just love how it gives that sort of misty effect outside as well. Lovely. So same process again. I'm just going to go back in and darken up some of the darks. Um, what I might actually do this time, before I put too much of the tone down, is just to put in these really light highlights so I know where they are. And I can actually incorporate them a little bit into some of the shading that I do. It's amazing isn't it? Just that little bit of white already is make a huge difference. And I don't want to put this everywhere where there's light. I want to reserve this for quite um, obvious highlights. Right there. There's a couple of little ones in there here. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time detailing the surrender out. I just want to give the impression that there's curls and layers of hair there.
She's looking a bit spotty, isn't she? <laughs> I promise it'll all work out.